morning we're starting a brand new series of uh, messages and it is entitled Bible Verses, favorite Bible verses that we all know and love and uh, sometimes misunderstand. And this is uh, one of those strange things you might ask, well, if we all know and love them, it seems like we would have a pretty good understanding of them. And that's true. I believe that that's true. God's people do have the mind of Christ when it comes to understanding or interpreting Scripture. But sometimes we kind of divert our attention to something that is favorite, something that we like to hold on to, instead of interpreting it directly as God intended for us to do. Uh, what I mean by that is simply this. The verse, and I'm going to try to give this uh, explanation at the beginning of the series, I might refer to it a number of times over, but... The, one of the verses that Belinda read just a moment ago was 2 Timothy 2.15. Work hard so you can present yourself to God and receive his approval. That's why the message is entitled Ultimate Approval. We're looking for his approval. And then it says, be a good worker. And that's where the misunderstanding sometimes comes in with this particular verse. What does it mean to be a good worker? Well, the misunderstanding has to do with knowing the truth as opposed to doing the truth. You know, we can do both, and sometimes we only do one. Sometimes we know and don't do. Is that clear? That's, that's, that's fairly clear. Um, the scripture says study to be approved. A good worker that doesn't need to be ashamed, but rightly divides the word of truth rightly divide, that's King James by the way, uh, if we rightly divide it, if we rightly understand it, we pick it apart, we parse it, we pull the meat off the bones, if you will, of what the scripture says, that's one thing. And we can know that. Once we understand it, we know it. But to understand in the biblical sense is more than just knowing it is taking what you know and doing. So, without the one, there is not the other. And so, it's not a bad thing to know something. The scripture even tells us to hide the word of God in our heart that we might not, what? Hide the word of God in your heart that I might not sin against you. You see, with every bit of knowing, there is some kind of doing. Let's dig in. More than 500 years ago, Johannes Gutenberg invented the printing press. And the very, very first book to roll off that press was what? The Bible. And it became a bestseller ever since. In October of 1987, the Gutenberg original Bible that was came off of that original press was purchased for over $5 million. At the time, it was the largest sum of money ever paid for a printed book. But the true value of God's Word is, without question, priceless. It is God's gift to us. You can't assign a money value to that. What can we say about the Bible in terms of knowing and doing that really speaks to our hearts today and really helps us to pull this verse apart of 2 Timothy 2.15 about studying to show ourselves approved, a workman that doesn't need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. How do we put this in street clothes so that we can wear it? Well, as a Christian, living a life of a disciple of Christ is something that finds daily even moment by moment direction in the ultimate truth, which is God's Word. Now, you have heard people talk about your truth and my truth. Isn't that popular these days? Well, that's true for you, but for me. Well, for God, truth is truth. And there is no your truth and my truth. There is only truth. 
And so taking our directions from the Word of God, which is the truth of God, which is the character of God, which is ultimate truth. A lot of people say there's no such thing as ultimate truth or absolute truth. But in reality, if you go to Holy Scripture, you're going to find absolute truth without any admixture of error. It is truth. Everything that we think, say, and do, if we're going to live life as a functioning Christian, everything that we say, think, or do must have a biblical basis that ultimately honors God and draws people to Jesus. That's what a Christian does. I would like for us to do a little exercise to kind of round this out in how to access that in your, uh, to access that in your life. This is what is important to becoming the kind of disciple or follower of Jesus Christ, which Scripture says brings God's ultimate approval. So, are you ready? Let's go. Let's do this. I'm going to say a list of 17 words. They are on the screen. Those 17 words, I want you to hear them as I speak them, but I also want you to understand them. Uh, or I want you rather I want you to raise your hand if you don't understand a single one of these words. Okay. All right. Here's the list. Left. Left. <laughs> left. Right. In your case, <laughs> ascending, alternate, power, third, miles, U-turn, wait, stop sign, double back, old sawmill, deer, wait, follow, cross, and laundry. Now, I didn't see any hands raised. Everybody understand every one of those 17 words? You got those. You know those words, right? Now, since we're clear on that, now let me use those same words to help you get where you're going. Because I want to send you somewhere, okay? You ready? You ready for this? You know these words, right? Any objection? All in favor, say aye. Aye. Uh -huh. <laughs> When you leave here, take three lefts and a right, but do it in ascending order, alternating your turns, until you come to a stop sign where you need to make a U-turn, double back to the old sawmill road until you come to the place where there is a deer crossing. Follow the deer if he goes to where my grandmother's aunt let her laundry dry in the last century. Then take a hard right after the second left turn, but not down Old Bill's Farm Road. Got it? <laughs> that clear? You ready to go? What is the chance in the world, in the universe, that you might wind up where I sent you? There's probably more of a chance that you'll give the preacher a black eye the next time you see him, right? Here's the point of that bit of foolishness as it applies to 2 Timothy 2.15. You have about as much chance of following my directions and winding up where I sent you as you do becoming an approved disciple who follows God's way and God's will and God's kingdom if you will not study his word. I mean, you'd have to study my directions, and man, you'd have to have Google, you would probably drive Google crazy if you tried to follow those directions. <laughs> right? But if you won't study God's Word, which is the roadmap to life, how are you going to live life in an improved fashion for God? God honors His Word, not our feelings, not our favorite doctrines, or Grandma's favorite sayings. If God's Word is going to have any effect on our lives and on this world, it has to be taken in and given out. Remember I said, every time there is something of a knowing, there has to be something of a doing that follows it. The problem with our world today is not the irrelevance of so-called out-of-date doctrine or a Bible that 
got dust on it, but the indifference of people, and particularly and sadly God's family, not living by God's word because they don't take time to study it. It's not just that we're being deliberately disobedient. We haven't studied, and therefore we don't know. Most of us have studied Scripture maybe a little bit more than we um, think we have, simply by listening to the hymns. There's an awful lot of doctrine in there. Simply by attending church, you're going to catch some by osmosis. But listen, if you don't take Scripture in your own hands, and if you don't wrestle with it in your own life, if you don't complain to God about what's written there, how in the world is He going to change you? That scripture is not going to change anything. In short, my friends, you cannot get from here to there if you don't follow the map, especially when we're talking about God's kingdom. And that is the roadmap. So this morning what I want to do is to share with you some reasons why I study God's Word. And it makes sense to me, and I hope it will make sense to you this morning. There are seven of them, and they're quick to go through. We're not going to be here past probably 6 p.m. tonight. So hang in there with me and let's dig in. I want to show you these seven reasons why I study God's Word so they don't make sense to you. First of all, I need truth in my life. Romans chapter 3 verse 4 says, even if everyone else is a liar, God is true. Paul said to the Roman church that judgment is a reality and truth, the truth of God, will overcome anything. I study the Word of God because it is truth, and truth overcomes the natural and spiritual judgments that I face as a human being, a sinful human being. The truth of Jesus is what sets me free from condemnation. I study, first of all, because of truth. Secondly, I need strong faith. That's another reason I study. Romans chapter 10 and verse 17 says, Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, the good news about Jesus Christ. There's a promise and also a precept in that scripture. Faith is available for the trials of life. Faith comes from hearing. That's the promise. God promises to us if we will hear. What does it mean to hear? Go back to what he said, what Paul said to Timothy about hearing or studying, if we hear that presupposes we're going to take it in, understand it as the truth of God, and then we are going to do something about it. The promise is that by hearing God's Word, by listening to it, studying it, we will understand it, and then we are bound to put it into practice. And that's the precept. Precept is that fact that faith comes on God's terms, which is the ultimate truth of His Word. And if we put it into practice in our life, we will receive God's approval. Listen, if you desire to have faith to overcome the trials in life, everybody who's ever had a trial in life, let me hear you say amen at this point. Yeah. Whew, man, that's about 100%, isn't it? We all face trials. We all face tough times. If you're going to face the tough times, the trials, it will come standing against those trials and overcoming them will come because of the reading and understanding and most of all the practice of God's Word. Dr. Billy Graham once said that faith and works concept of hearing and doing, they work like breathing. In breathing, what do you do? You go, and then you go, you know, that breath doesn't stay down there, right? It, it gets put to use. Faith, Billy Graham said, is taking in the gospel. Works is taking the gospel out to the world. The Bible, which is truth, leads me to Jesus who provides me the breath of new life and then I take that out into the world with me. If you want to have a strong faith, you have to feed your faith on the Word of God. What's that old thing about two dogs, two junkyard dogs? You bring them home with you, you feed one, but you starve the other. What happens when they fight? Which one's going to win? The one that's been fed, right? The one that's been cared for. It's the same way with your soul. If you feed 
the natural side of you, the fleshly side of you, if you feed the side of you that tends towards, I'm going to do what I want to do, that's that natural side, the fleshly side, the sinful side, instead of the spiritual side that says, I want to do what God wants me to do. It, depending on which side you fear, feed, that's the, that's the side that's going to win in your life. So if you want to serve God, you want to have the kind of faith that's going to help you overcome obstacles. You need to feed your faith. You need to feed the spiritual side of you. And when the tests come, that spiritual side will be tougher and stronger than the tests and the storms that life throws at you. But woe to you if you feed the selfish nature. You're just going to fight like the rest of the world does. Number three, I also need sound wisdom in my life. Scripture is that, James chapter 1, verse 5. If you need wisdom, ask our generous God, and He will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking. Have you ever been surprised by somebody you thought was your friend, who when you said something, laughed at you and talked about you behind your back? That's what the Scripture is trying to tell you here, is that God will never do that to you. You ask him for wisdom, you say, God, I'm a dunce, and I really need some wisdom for what's going to happen next week. God's not, God's not going to go, boy, I'm Russell, boy, he really is a jerk. I wish I could do something. He's not going to do that. He will not rebuke you. He will not say, who do you think you are coming to me? That's what kind of what, what rebuke is. Instead, it says that he'll give us faith. He'll give us that strength. He'll give us that wisdom. Now in a fallen world, can I get an amen there? We do live in a fallen world. Survival can be tricky if you go it alone without the help of God's word. There was a pilot I read about contacted the tower one time for help. He said, I'm 300 miles from the runway. I'm out of fuel. I'm only 200 feet off the ground. What happened, Tom? The tower guy came back on the radio and said, repeat after me, our Father. Lord in heaven. That's kind of a pilot's joke, I guess. I mean, it takes a lot of godly wisdom to live in a fallen world. And it's available for those who ask. Real wisdom is that which teaches us to depend upon God. I read another story, true story, about Danny Simpson up in Canada. He took an old hand-me-down Colt 45, an old one that was in the family a while, and robbed a bank in Ontario, Canada. When he robbed the bank, he got $6,000, made his getaway, but when the police caught up with him, they confiscated, obviously, the money and uh, put Danny in jail. They took the gun as well. And when the lab technician was processing this gun for fingerprints, he recognized that it was not just an old gun, it was a collector's edition called 45, worth about $100,000. Danny just, he owned a gun worth $100,000, but he never imagined his access to the asset that he held. And that's so like a believer who has the priceless availability of God's wisdom and never takes advantage of it. How do you take advantage of it? We simply need to ask. If you ignore this wisdom that God will give you, you are like Danny Simpson. You're robbing the bank for $6,000 when you've already got $100,000 in your back pocket. Number four, I also need to see godly beauty in my life. That's why I study God's Word. Isaiah chapter 63, to all who mourn in Israel, he will give a crown of beauty for ashes, a joyous blessing instead of mourning, festive praise instead of despair. The human mind understands most concepts as pictures. I think what Isaiah was doing in that passage was seeing the Lord Jesus Christ as receiving the ashes of our life. Has your life ever seemed like it's just laying there in ashes? He receives the ashes of our life and returns to us the beauty of a new life. That's what oil represents, among very many other things in Scripture, is the oil of gladness. He would take our mourning for himself and lavishly anoint us with the oil of gladness. 
That is very much like last week's exchange of grace for thorns. Remember we talked about Paul and the thorn in the flesh that he had and how Jesus took that, that, that thorn and turned it into his grace, his blessing. The Lord takes the heaviness of sorrow and he turns it into praise that we wear like an elegant gown of triumph. I can honestly say that I've never gone to God's word with a need and not found that Jesus had already anticipated and provided better than I could ever ask. We would be here indeed until midnight tonight if I stood here and just told you story after story of the blessings that Elizabeth and I have received. I mean, there have been times when we were down to two eggs and uh, maybe a, a half a glass of milk in the refrigerator and, uh, you know, it was either her parents or my parents that sent the, uh, the, uh, the St. Bernard with the cask, you know. Well, no, he never sent that to us. I mean, the blessings that have come. I don't want to waste too much time just sharing my personal stories about that. But it's true. Fifthly, I also need genuine encouragement in my life. First Samuel chapter 30 is all about David and one of the sorrowful times that he was in. It says in chapter 30, verse 6, David was now in great danger. David's life and his position as king over Israel was in danger because all of his men, his soldiers, were very bitter about losing their sons and daughters. And they began to talk of stoning him. Wow, that's what I call a revolt. But David found strength or encouragement, is another word for that word, in the Lord his God. It, it happened during one of the wars that Israel was fighting against their arch enemies, the Amalekites. David suffered a humiliating defeat. One of the cities was taken, it was looted, it was burned, and all of the inhabitants, including two of David's wives, were taken captive. David's leadership was in question, and the people that he led, the army that he led, was talking about stoning the king. Now, I've been at that place, a leader, a pastor, a president, anybody who leads anybody has been at that place. Uh, I'm not sure which president it was, it may have been all of them talked about how lonely it may be at the top. Well, it can get that way when there is an anger that is in the group that is being led. I've been at that place. I've been so discouraged at times, I wanted to give up. You remember me saying just a few moments ago how Elizabeth and I feel so happy and blessed to be here? Well, it's because we know how to compare that. We know what it's like on the other side when you're not happy to be there. In one church I served, when I was very young in ministry, uh, this was quite a few years ago, there was so much trouble. There was a couple of the families reminded me of the Hatfields and McCoys. You know what I'm talking about? Um, it was the feud that was going on. Their fussing got to me, and I began to lose hope for that church, not just for me or for my family, for the difficulties, because um, the two families centered their problems around the, the pastor. But I might confess that as a preacher, some would call me a religious professional, uh, I know and I can teach a whole lot more about the Christian life than I can actually live. Why is that? Because I spend my life studying it. But you know what? I'm only one man. And it's overwhelming when you read all of the scripture and you say, oh, I've got to do this, I've got to do that. And sometimes, you know, you get really blown away by it, don't you? But God knows that about Russell, about how limited I am. And he has always provided me with two things as I have pastored these past 40 some odd years. His word, which we're talking about this morning, but also his people, you. He's provided me those two things. When I turn to God's word, I find encouragement that God hasn't forgotten my address. But there's that other thing about his people. 
In that particular church, it was Missy Coleman that God provided to seal the deal on me sticking it out until God moved, until God did something. Missy lived the faith better than her pastor did. There was no question in my mind about that. At one discouraging moment when it was so dark, all I could think about was how soon can we pack and be gone? Missy saw my despair, and this mid-80s something saint, with the wrinkles of many a spiritual battle to prove it. She got me in the open space between the two church buildings, and she took me by the arms with those arthritis-ridden hands of hers. She smiled, that wrinkly smile of hers, where you couldn't see her eyes because she was smiling so wide. And she said, look at me right in the eyes. I, I believe she was looking at me right in the eyes, even though I didn't see those eyes. Through that wrinkled smile, she said, Preacher, it's going to be all right. I'll tell you what. I thank you, Missy. I wanted to get away from her as quickly as I possibly could. I was about to break down and cry. I thanked her. I tried to keep a stiff upper lip. But I just couldn't see it, that it would be all right. This church was coming unglued. There was nothing that I could do about it. You know what? I was right. You know what else? So was Missy. Wait a minute, preacher. How does that work? Well, I was right first. The trouble escalated until that mess finally erupted like Mount St. Helens an explosion of theological nonsense. But Missy was right because it wound up with the Hatfield and McCoy families leaving that church. And that church seemed like Death Valley for months afterward. But Missy's foresight saw beyond the mess and she saw all the way to what God was holding in his hands. In the days and the weeks and the months and the several years that followed that time, God changed the spirit of that church. And we grew both spiritually and in numbers for the rest of my time with those folks. Today, where there was a sanctuary a little bit smaller than this one, when I started out, Today, on that grounds, is a sanctuary that seats about 600 people. And it's a driving force for God to bring people to Jesus Christ. I'm not attributing any of that to me. I'm saying this. God can take a church that's being blown apart of its own choosing and do something magnificent with it. I mean, that is what Jesus does. The Word of God tells me that God is rooting for me. God thinks I'm something special. Sometimes I want to say, Lord, you need to get your glasses checked if you think I'm special. But He thinks I'm special enough to have His only Son die for me. So I am encouraged by His Word. Number six, I need peace, not just a vacation. <laughs> not just a vacation. Philippians 4, and verse 7, a very familiar verse. We'll get to that one in a few weeks, but listen to it. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. If you listen to the humanists and the New Agers, peace is going to be found in achieving status, cleaner air, protecting the spotted owl eggs, and better education. Now listen, I'm interested in all of that. I want to protect our environment. I want to learn how to better preserve the earth that God has said to subdue and to work on his behalf. However, I don't want any part of any pseudo-satisfying peace that the world can offer. Jesus said that his peace was not like the world's peace, fleeting, fading. Jesus' peace is the everlasting kind that no circumstance can touch. It's the peace of God that passes all understanding. It's that which is unreproducible by humans, demons, or anything else in the universe. It's the kind of peace that only comes when you are assured that Jesus lives inside your soul. Do you have that peace this morning?
President Herbert Hoover of years and years ago was asked one time if all the criticism of his presidency didn't at least irk him. Uh, this is how President Hoover responded. He said, no, I never bothered by that. When I went into politics, I knew what I should expect, so when he came, I wasn't, I wasn't upset. And then he said, besides, I have peace at the center, you know. He was talking about his commitment to Christ. His commitment to Christ. I can offer an amen at that point, and it's thanks to Missy Coleman and God. Seventh, and lastly, I need to obey the God who will judge me. 2 Timothy 2.15, and if you have forgotten that that's where we begin, here we come, full circle, back to the beginning. Timothy wrote, work hard, uh, Paul wrote to Timothy, work hard so you can present yourself to God and receive his approval. That, folks, is ultimate approval. Be a good worker, one who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly explains the word of truth. So, here we are, back full circle to the beginning. Obedience is all about learning and living God's word. Not enough to know it here. It's got to show up here. Amen? It's got to show up here. The Word of God is my truth, my faith, my wisdom, all beauty. It's my encouragement. It's my peace. But above all, the Word of God is my guide for every choice I make. If I am to have the ultimate approval of He who is Lord, Teacher, and my God, it has to be because I follow his word. I study it to learn it, and then I put it in my hands to do it. There's a side benefit to all of this, by the way. As you take in God's word, as you study God's word, as you begin to put it into your hands and let it get active, what does that mean? When it means to not overlook the needy people, it means in some ways your hands are going to be active. Uh, Eddie Gallimore did a little bit of that this week. He, he traveled 5 million miles to deliver 20 flood buckets. You know what? The Word of God says, don't neglect the needy and those who've been through a rough time. So what did Eddie do? Well, he thought he was getting rid of those things, getting them out of his way down in the boiler room down there. But I know what was really in his heart was he was putting those buckets that you all donated got together, he was putting that where they needed to be in hands that would take those flood buckets to those people who are still cleaning up after the hurricane. What about, oh yeah, preacher gets to it sooner or later, what about the tithe? You know, the scripture says the tithe belongs to the Lord. So does that belong in another car payment, another boat payment, or whatever payment? Belongs in the Lord's house on the Lord's day at the Lord's worship time. What about your testimony? Is that something for you to hold on to and know? Yes, certainly. What about putting it in those hands and offering it to somebody who needs to know Jesus? The side benefit is when you start to do that, when you take it all in and you begin to give it out, the side benefit is the laughter of the redeemed. I don't know if you're familiar with that term or not. Let me tell you about a friend of mine who's now in glory, Rodney. One day, years ago, he called to tell me he was living in Florida. We were living here in North Carolina. We served together in the same church. Friends, good friends, close to being, I would say, best of friends. Rodney called me. One day, years ago, he called to tell me that his doctor told him that his heart wasn't working right. The test showed the bottom half was on vacation. The scary words came over the phone, emergency, operate, doctors. So my friend knew enough what God's word said. He wanted to put it in his hands now and get it moving. And so, in obedience to his word, uh, Rodney called everybody he knew who would pray. And he called me, and I, he knew I would pray. And we prayed over the phone, but I kept praying. 
The next day, the doctors did some more tests. When the doc came back into the room, he told my friend Rodney, he said, well, there's one more coincidence that we need to talk about. I knew, because I know that's a buzzword with Rodney. Uh, whenever he started off, whenever he started off telling me about a coincidence, I knew what he was going to say, how God worked something out. The doctor said to him, one more coincidence we need to talk about. He said, you must have mobilized the whole world to pray for you, son. There isn't a thing wrong with your heart today. That's what the test showed. When my friend called me again to let me know, we laughed the laughter of the redeemed. One more time. Now, there are no people who laugh with more sincerity or more reason than the people of God who seek white hot after the kingdom of God. Let's pray together. Father God, you've given us every tool necessary to be your people and to work in your vineyard. Lord, our prayer is that we would take hold of all you have to offer each of us, gifts for serving, your Holy Spirit for guidance, and the power of your mighty Son's right hand in whose name we pray. Father, help us to make our hearts willing to lay aside the sin that so easily besets us and open our spirits and hands to you your will that we might be approved workers, rightly handling your holy word for the glory, honor, and praise to which you alone are worthy, O Lord. We pray in the name of the Son, cooperating with the Spirit, to honor and lift up the majesty of the Father. Let it be so in each of our lives, we pray. And God's people say, Amen. Amen. 467.